Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about solutions to Maxwell's equations. Not just any solution, one particular solution. And this lecture is going to be a little bit mathematical. We're going to do a lot of manipulation of Maxwell's equations and show that, that waves, particularly waves that move through space and time, are solutions to Maxwell's equations. And, and this may seem a little pedantic and trivial, but as we'll learn in the next lecture, these wave solutions are really, really powerful in what they allow us to do. So if you'd like to skip this lecture because the mathematics really doesn't appeal to you, there's not going to be a lot that's really practical in here, but it's going to be valuable to you if you kind of want to understand where waves, particularly electromagnetic waves, arise from and how they're related to Maxwell's equations. If you're following along in my class, uh, section 7.1 of the textbook covers this material. So not to uh, belabor the point here, but I'd just like to remind you that we're not in electrostatics anymore. A lot of the equations we derived aren't valid when the electric and magnetic fields change in time. And so essentially what we do is we get rid of most of these equations. and We end up with four equations, which are, are known as Maxwell's equations. It turned out that Maxwell originally had 12 equations when he first derived these, but they got reduced down to four over time as he figured out redundancies. And these equations, and you should really remember these, um, come in two forms, differential forms and integral forms. And it may look to you that there aren't really four Maxwell's equations, there are eight Maxwell's equations. But let's take this slide and let's um, expand our differential form so we can more of a comparison. Um, what you see is that you can write each of the four Maxwell's equations in two different forms, one being the differential form, one being the integral form. These uh, red arrows here show the relations between them. So for example, the divergence of the electric flux being equal to the charge density is the same thing as saying the integral across a surface, a closed surface, of the electric flux is equal to the total charge enclosed, which as we know is just Gauss's law. And so integral and differential forms are just two ways of describing each of the four Maxwell equations. And this has been mentioned before, but it's worth talking about we, why we have both differential forms and integral forms. It turns out that when you're working with fields distributed over an area or a region in space, that the differential forms are usually easier to work with because derivatives themselves, and every single one of these um, equations here in the left-hand column contains some kind of derivative term. Derivatives aren't defined um, unless you have things distributed over space. Derivatives of discontinuities are not defined. Um, the integral form, on the other hand, is really much more useful to work with when you have discrete things, like you're given a wire bent into a curve and you want to calculate something, um, you have point things, then the integral forms really are better ways to calculate the things you need using Maxwell's equations. So two forms, differential or derivative and integral forms, you use them in different situations and you use the form of Maxwell's equation that's the easiest and best to solve the problem you're given. Now, really especially when you look at the differential forms, um, this, 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 it's actually fairly easy to memorize Maxwell's equations. Uh, for the power of these things, describing all electromagnetic propagation, they're really not that long. So I'd like to do an example um, that demonstrates that, that even the relatively simple looking forms when we write them in sort of our shorthand uh, calculus or vector calculus notation really aren't that simple. In other words, don't get lulled into thinking that the solutions to these necessarily are trivial because the equations are short. short. So let's, let's take a look at this, for example. And we'll, we're basically going to look at the differential form of Faraday's law. The curl of the electric field is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux. And we saw in the previous video how this gives rise to, to fields, that electric fields and magnetic fields create each other. But if we write this out mathematically, what D? We see that essentially, um, if you write the curl out, you get this fairly long expression here, where you essentially have both x, y, and z terms, and so we essentially have six different terms in the curl. The rate of change of the magnetic field has three terms for the x, y, and z terms because it's a vector, and you'll notice that every element of the field, in other words, the um, x pointing e sub x, the y pointing e sub y, and the z pointing e sub z, each depend on four variables, the x, y, and z position and time. Similarly, the magnetic flux, which has an x component, a y component, and a z component, 
also is composed of three of four different variables, three spatial variables and a time variable. So this fairly simple equation right here, if you take the curl and expand it out, you see it really has a lot of terms to them. None of it's that difficult, but you have to understand these equations are really long. The shorthand notation hides the length of the calculations that are involved sometimes. Luckily, life's a little easier than solving this big giant equation because we know we've chosen a set of axes, a coordinate system where the axes are orthogonal to one another. And we talked about this a long time ago when we talked about electric charges and orthogonal axes. Remember that essentially a, a good coordinate system is one in which the movement along the x direction doesn't change things in the y or the z direction. You can, you can move a point in x as much as you want and you won't change the y and z value. That's what it means to have coordinate axis systems. Essentially what this means in Maxwell's equations is that you have three completely separate set of equations that are implied by this term right here, uh, Faraday's law in the differential form. You have an x term, and notice this x term may depend on x, y, z, and t, but it is a separate equation for x, you have a y equation, and then finally you also have a z equation. So the lesson of this is that you can separate in a good coordinate system the three orthogonal components of your fields and do solutions separately and also simultaneously. And again, this was actually just a little bit of a diversion to show that the simple or relatively simple forms of Maxwell's equations have a lot of terms to them. In order to actually solve these things or particularly code these things, you have to break them down as I've shown you here and deal with all the terms in many, many cases. Let's get on with the main show here, which is really to demonstrate how Maxwell's equations um, give rise to a, a form of electric and magnetic fields that correspond to waves. And again, we're going to do the, the outlines of a mathematical derivation here. And um, if you're interested, follow along. If not, then you can skip to the next lecture. But maybe there's going to be some useful stuff in how, how we understand waves or a solution to Maxwell's equations, but also into some of the limitations that go along with making this assumption. So it turns out that there's an identity, a mathematical identity in vector calculus that is this equation right here. The curl of the curl of a vector is equal to the gradient of the divergence of a vector minus the Laplacian um, of that vector, del squared of the vector. Um, you can plug in a generic vector and show this equality is true. I personally don't know of a, a separate proof to this, but it turns out to be true. So if we basically make the assumption that the permittivity epsilon, remember this is, is the way we characterize electrical properties of materials, that the permittivity does not vary in space. In other words, it's isotropic. It's the same everywhere. Then essentially we can rewrite the curl of the curl of the electric field in this form. And notice we had to make this assumption because we replaced E with D here, or epsilon E, and we pulled epsilon outside of our spatial derivative. And if, if epsilon varied in space, we wouldn't be allowed to do this. So this is the first of our mathematical steps. The second of our mathematical steps is to use Gauss's law. But in order to use Gauss's law to simplify this, we're going to have to make a second assumption, which is there's no free or movable charge. We don't have charges floating around in the region we're interested in. If we do, this solution of waves is like totally out the window. It's not going to work. But with Gauss's law, we know that the divergence of the electric flux is equal to the charge. If we assume there's no charge, this term is equal to zero. Well, if I can do this, then I can cross that term out of the equation right there, and I can simplify my curl term to look like that. Step number two of this derivation we're doing. Along with this, we're going to make a substitution and look at this term right here, the curl of the electric field. Well, we know Faraday's law in differential form and one of Maxwell's equation tells us the curl of the electric field is negative the rate of change of the magnetic flux. So by doing this substitution here to here and here to here, I come up with this, this step right here. So one more step along the path we're following. Okay, on the last slide, this is where we've gotten the curl of the rate of change of the magnetic flux is equal to del squared of the electric field. We make another assumption here that the permeability, mu, doesn't vary in space. It's the same assumption of, of the, the region of space being isotropic or not having material properties that vary in space. If I do that, essentially what I can do is I can um, pull out mu away from B, 
And then, essentially, since I'm allowed to rearrange derivatives in whatever order I want, um, I pull the time derivative outside here, so it appears right here. I pull mu outside because of my assumption number three, and if things mu did vary in space, this solution doesn't work. And that leaves me del cross h um, inside here. So essentially, I've just taken this equation and turned it into that equation by rearranging my derivatives and making the assumption the permeability is isotropic. Um, again, we can do a pretty simple substitution. We know that the curl of H is equal to the um, current that flows and the rate of change of the electric flux vector, or the displacement current. So I take this, go here, substitute this back right into here, and I end up with this equation right here. Yet one more step along the direction we're going. You'll notice that what I've done is I've just basically replaced the curl of H with the conduction current plus the displacement current here. Well, if we assume that the material is not conductive, um, in other words, sigma, the conductivity, is equal to zero, that allows us to get rid of the term. So we're making a fourth assumption here, um, along with our isotropic assumptions, that the material has no conductivity, that we're in essentially a region where electricity doesn't conduct. And that allows me to simplify my equation uh, to this form right here. Now all I have to do is rearrange some derivatives. Essentially, because of my assumption that um, mu and epsilon are unchanging, I pull epsilon away from D, and so I write mu epsilon outside. I can take the derivative of the time derivative of the electric field being equal to del squared of the electric field and rewrite it this way. So essentially what I've done is I've come up with a very well-known equation, which is called the wave equation, that the second spatial derivative of the electric field minus mu epsilon um, of the second derivative of the time variation of the electric field is equal to zero, or simply by, by moving things on either side of the equal sign, we can see relationships between spatially changing electric fields and the variation of the electric field in time. And of course, if I expand del squared out and I expand this out, what this equation really looks like in its full form, recognizing the electric field can vary in three spatial dimensions and a time dimension is given right here. Now, there's a very powerful heuristic we use in engineering that um, my friends in mathematics and physics would probably violently disagree with. But in my experience, that when you're confronted with differential equations, um, you either look up the solution or guess at what the solution is. And as I said, this equation, known as the wave equation, is something we can simply look up the solution to. So essentially what I've said is we're going to assume a sinusoidal solution or some kind of sine wave solution. Well, well, I don't even have to assume it because I can look this up. And that's going to give me the answer to this um, second order partial differential equations. And I want to stress something, that we're assuming a sinusoidal solution because it's really useful to solve a lot of problems with. But it's not the only solution to Maxwell's equations. It's a single possible solution to the wave equation. And there can be other equations that have different forms that are going to be equally valid solutions to Maxwell's equations. But because this is an undergraduate entry-level class in electromagnetics, we're going to take the simplest of all possible solutions and sort of work with that instead of going into much more complicated solutions. So my next assumption is I'm going to say that assume the time variation of the electric field is sinusoidal. Um, so what that means is I can basically take the T variation of the electric field and pull it out into this exponential term. And remember, some of the very first videos in this long series of electromagnetics were about waves. We'll go back and revisit that material in the next lecture. Um, but this is something I can do. I can separate out the spatial and temporal variation of the electric field with no problem. Another perhaps more controversial assumption I'm going to make is that the wave changes sinusoidally in the z direction and otherwise has a constant value everywhere in x and y. So no matter where I look in x and y, the electric field is going to point in the same direction and have exactly the same value, at least in my initial s solution to this, um, for one wave. Um, and that it's going to vary sinusoidally in the z direction. This gives me a solution that has this form right here. Um, we'll look at more complicated solutions later, but this is a good one. And it's actually a fairly good solution, because although the waves may not actually propagate in the z direction, remember that I'm allowed to rotate my coordinate axes and point the axes in whatever direction I want. So essentially, you can think of this as saying, OK, the wave's going in some direction. I'm going to rotate my coordinate axes so that the direction the wave is going corresponds to the z direction. And if you do that, this is going to be the general solution called a plane wave solution we're going to explore in detail in the next video.
Now, essentially, then what I do is I take this form of the solution, um, and I plug it into my, my wave equation, my differential equation. So I just take the value of free and plug it in there. And, and you can do this, and it turns out that you get a k squared for the z um, term and an omega squared for the time term. And when you solve everything out by canceling the exponentials and, and the fields on both sides, you find out that there's a relationship between the k term we used, uh, which remember is the phase change of the wave along z, and omega, which is the time change of the wave along z, and that k and omega are related to the propagation constants. And we're going to leave this hanging for now and cover it in the next lecture. So let's summarize where we are. Um, what we've learned is that one possible solution to Maxwell's equations are a wave that has this format where we're essentially saying that has a, an electric field vector E naught that has a sinusoidal variation both in time and along the Z axis. That this variable K is given by the frequency of the wave which we understand as well as the permeability and the permittivity of the region we're propagating through. We've also learned that this solution is only completely valid under certain assumptions that the permittivity, epsilon, doesn't vary in space. In other words, it's isotropic, that there's no charge that can move, that the permeability, mu, is also isotropic, and that the material is not conductive. So for a wave propagating through the air, propagating through vacuum, propagating through many insulators, this is a valid solution. You have waves going through metal, eh, not so good anymore. Um, this solution, it turns out, describes a wave that moves in free space exactly the way waves moved on transmission lines or on wires. So we've essentially made a realization here, hopefully, that we don't need to have a wire to carry an electric signal, that electric and magnetic fields can carry signals through space. We know this in real life because we can listen to the radio, um, but it's good to put this in a more mathematical format. And in order to come th to this solution, we've assumed that the wave moves in the z direction and that the electric field points in some direction to the xy plane, but the value of the electric field is constant everywhere in x and y. Again, simplifying assumptions, but they allow us to come up with a solution that's actually pretty easy. So let's just wrap up um, before we go into plane waves in detail in the next uh, video on some of the philosophical considerations of what this means. Again, Maxwell, after starting with 12 equations, got it down to four equations, uh, basically Gauss's law, the fact that there are no magnetic charges, Faraday's law, and Ampere's law, we can express these four Maxwell's equations either in differential or integral form. Um, these arrows essentially relate these. These are exactly the same equations, some expressed as derivatives, some expressed as integrals. Which one you choose depends completely on the type of problem you're solving. They're not better or worse, right or wrong. It's all context dependent. And the philosophical consideration is that Maxwell's equations describe electric and magnetic fields that vary in time. And that time-varying electric and magnetic fields that don't satisfy these equations can't exist. This is a pretty damn big claim to be making. The things that don't satisfy these equations don't exist. Um, but for electrical engineering, um, unless you get into some complications with quantum mechanics and things, this is actually a really good assumption. So Maxwell's equations not only tells us how things propagate, they tell us what things can be in electrical engineering.